Aloha, this is Professor Porter. This is part 10 of a 10 part series of introduction to mock trial. And essentially this is a uh, bonus recording, a bonus video. It's how I judge and evaluate mock trial. I think I've mentioned in earlier videos that I have served as an evaluator in many a mock trial and uh, not only coach my own teams, but develop programs and ran competitions in mock trial, mostly in uh, law school, but I've also served as an evaluator in college and high school mock trial. So this is some tips as to how I judge, how I evaluate mock trial if I'm sitting there watching and trying to decide uh, what team should prevail. As always, uh, follow uh, and subscribe to the channel, uh, email me with any questions or requests, comment on the videos, and look on the channel for other uh, other topics in trial advocacy and evidence and, and mock trial to come. This is just the introduction to mock trial. So we're gonna talk about five things that, that I look for. And, and, and even as I say that I look for these things in mock trial to decide uh, you know, which team, which advocates might shine in, in a mock trial competition. Uh, it's really one of those things. I'm not sure I could watch one without evaluating these things. So it's not necessarily looking for it, hunting for it. It's, it's, it's going to be obvious, uh, these five topics that we talk about. And the first one is which team, uh, and, and I always say team and advocates in these because I think it's going to come down to some individual performances as well. But most of the really highly effective stuff that we do, we do as a team and as a unit and it's decided upon in practice and you can see that it's a rehearsed uh, team effort. Uh, but I also look for individual advocates and it's who's connecting with the jury. We've talked about several things that have to do with connection to the jury. The first and foremost is if you're reading prepared speeches, if your head is down and you're uh, on some script and you're reading uh, and not actually looking at the jurors. If uh, when you're asking in witness examinations, when you're asking questions of a witness, is it a conversation that the jury and the evaluator feels like they're a part of? Is the answer being delivered uh, to the jury? Or is it a conversation that I feel like I'm uh, watching from behind a screen that I'm not really a part of it? So the jury's there. The jury is, uh, you know, is evaluating you the same way they would be the triers of fact in an actual trial. So you should be catering to them as an audience. The answers for your witnesses, especially those witnesses that uh, that are on your team that you can prepare for should be, you should ask a question to that witness and then in sort of a triangular way, uh, the, the witness's answer should be delivered to the jury. Um, and really, it's just even if you are able to, as a team and as an individual advocate, divorce yourself from notes, you can't have that glazed over look in your eyes where you're just trying to remember what you uh, planned. You actually have to talk to and connect with and, and make arguments uh, about the evidence. When you're asking a question, you're, you're taking care of those audience members that would be jurors in a real trial, but are most oftentimes evaluators. Uh, in a mock trial, that is, you have to be interested in your presentation. You have to be interested in the questions you're asking and the answers that are given, even if you've done it a hundred times in practice. So part of it is you are connecting with a jury, a mock trial evaluator serving as juror the same way that when I'm presenting a trial uh, and I have live jurors, I, I need to connect with them. I need to be believable. I need to be likable. I need to be credible. I need to be uh, dynamic in my presentation and I need to be interested in my own presentation. When you look at some trial advocates, but more importantly, when you look at some mock trial advocates, they, they just have that look of, I, I've done this so many times that I'm bored by it. I know the questions. I know the answers. Well, be mindful of the fact that you have an audience that's hearing it for the first time um, and, and really tend to that and be mindful of that. Uh, so I think I'm looking at which advocates, which team has their head down is going off a script. They're not gonna have my, uh, my highest evaluation. The one that's really taking care of that audience, thinking of me as an audience, having the witness answers directed through me, making arguments to me, like referring to things that happened in trial and crafting arguments that, I can, that, are, that are for me to compel me to move in, 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 uh, in a certain way in my verdict, or in this case, in my jury evalu evaluation form for mock trial. They're connecting with me. They're tending to me. They're making sure that I'm a part of the trial. Uh, that's the team that's going to do better in evaluations. 
next uh, we have a whole series of videos about theme and theory their theory is is how you win the case how you approach the case and your theme is what is that uh, that movie trailer that book cover what is that simple way uh, maybe it's a phrase maybe it's a word maybe it's a saying uh, something that you're going to use to help explain your case and really what you can notice from the get-go is one has this team made some choices has they have they made some choices about what's going to be part of their presentation and what's going to be in the outside looking in and by contrast if i'm an evaluator and it just looks like there's no choices that have been made everything that was in the packet whether it's a red heron whether it contributes whether it's a good fact whether it's a bad fact they're just saying it all again it's indiscriminate they're just going to repeat everything that's in the file you know instead i want a team that's making choices i want a team that says here's a theory about how we win this trial here are the facts and here are the items that are most important to us and they present just to that uh, they might cover other things but they're going to return and repeat and present to that uh, so I want a clear theory and, and with themes, uh, it, it's almost easier from the moment one of your advocates stands up an opening statement, I should hear and be able to write down on a piece of paper. What is that theme? Why do they think they're going to win theory while well, they win this case? But how are they helping explain it? What are they using? What are the catch words? What's a phrase by which they can, they can help me remember it, help me explain, uh, their side of the case, their perspective in the case. It should be referred to the words could be mixed up. Um, that is, if, if you have a theme that, um, uh, you know, this was, this was motive and opportunity and an opportunity to, um, to get close to the plaintiff motive and opportunity and opportunity to get close to the plaintiff, maybe a sec, a different time in opening. That was the opportunity. That was the opportunity to get close to the plaintiff. It's a slight shift off of the words, but I'm hitting that theme and I'm able to say it again, maybe later. Uh, in an examination, uh, was there an opportunity that presented that day? The witness comes forward. Yes, there was an opportunity to get close to the plaintiff. See, you know, it's thematic language. It's a way of explaining the case, but I'm, I'm, I'm returning to it. I'm revisiting it. I'm repeating it so much so that if someone said, what is their case about? What are the words that summarize their case? What are the words that they're using to portray their case to you? They, their motive and opportunity and opportunity to get close to the plaintiff. Those are the words that they repeated throughout. It might not mean anything. Thing. It might not be a good theme. It might not uh, carry the day in the trial, but it, there should at least be one there. And I can tell you the flip side of this is you hear an opening statement and it's got uh, two analogies in it. It's got one quotation from someone famous. It's got uh, uh, another triumphant of words, uh, you know, three words that are that are kitschy. Like, which one is it? Which one are you going to return to? You just said a whole bunch of things, uh, and I'm not sure which one's your theme, or you just are grabbing haphazardly some quotes and some kitschy words and some expressions that you're just throwing in and making part of your opening. And then if your teammate, if another advocate gets up during trial and I never hear any of those words again, uh, and then what often happens is then a different advocate gets up in closing and doesn't pull on any of the same those same things. So there were three or four of them. I'm not sure what's your theme. Was it the quote? Was it the collection of words? Was it that phrase? What what was it? And then somebody stands up that's on your team, and they do the same thing but with three different uh, you know orientations of a quote or a saying or words that that helped explain the case. Now now there's just a muddle of different things that could help me understand the case as a juror, but the clearly no connection uh, in this team and, and with the theme and theory of the case. So at the very least, how are you explaining this case? How are they saying it in an opening and hopefully saying it more than once? And how are they picking up on it in closing now that we have the benefit of all those witness examinations and the evidence that's been received? Uh, so we should be able to discern as a juror, as an evaluator, which one has made some decisions, has given some thought to how they're going to win this case and how they're going to explain it to people new to the case, and how have they repeated it and made it sort of thematic language where it's easy to pick up on. I know this case is about motive and opportunity and to get close to the plaintiff. Why? Because they said it throughout the entire trial. I know there is a theme. It might not be the winning theme. It might not be... Uh, you know, everything all rolled up into one, but at least I know where they're coming from. At least I know how they were trying to explain it. And usually without even looking for it, I can tell a team that's worked hard, worked together and made choices about a theme and theory and the ones that haven't are just showed up and it's like distinct independent presentations. And the first one is always better.
the next this this is a uh, this is a tough one um, because you could actually be better in some parts of the mock trial. You could be better on the law. You could understand the case better. You could even have a better theory and theme of the case. And professional, uh, you know, professionalism matters. Uh, the team that's acting professional matters. So if I have a lot of things that just are not lawyerly, uh, things that you would not do in trial, and if I see those, uh, maybe it's the way you're dressed. If you're not dressed like a professional, then I'm not going to take you as seriously. If you got jeans on, it's just going to be you're going to be evaluated differently. Um, uh, if you're not wearing a tie as a male or some type of business suit equivalent as a female, uh, you're going to be evaluated differently. Uh, but more important than than dress, it's like how are you behaving from the moment you get in the courtroom? If there's giggling, if it's uh, if if it's kind of like I'm watching high schoolers while I'm watching a mock trial, you know, even if it involves high schoolers, it doesn't come off as professional. And another team that is at attention, ready, waiting for the judge to come in, waiting for it to start, not scrambling around. Um, not having nervous laughs or nervous energy or, or talking about other things or making jokes. Uh, I'm going to go with a team that's more professional. And again, it's a, that might be merit aside or, or substance aside. Uh, during the trial, once it starts, there's often sort of the teams dial it up. But I'm going to encourage you from the moment that you cross the street to get into that building where your mock trial is, the moment you get into the conference room or mock trial courtroom or wherever the trial is going to take place, assume that professionalism then start then have a discussion with your teammate about what's appropriate to be talking about uh, we don't want panic even if even if something is completely off the rails and we we left a laptop at home it, the last thing you want to do in front of the people that are going to evaluate it is is panic and make it seem like the whole trial is going to end before it started so we're going to be professional and no matter what comes up we're going to handle it as professionals and we're going to do the best we can with what we have um, as it relates to uh, when one of your teammates is presenting, you are participating in that presentation. You're not scrambling around doing your own work. You're not uh, you're not worried about something else. You're worried about exactly where the camera is right then. And you recall in earlier videos I talked about, imagine there's a separate camera uh, that's, that's just on you the whole time. How do you want to be portrayed as a professional? You don't want eye rolls. You don't want sighs. You don't want desperate whispers and scratching notes to each other. If you're going to need to communicate, you're going to do so as a professional and not raise any, not draw any attention to yourself. Um, and, and, you know, there's a flip side to all these things. I think people that, uh, if they're in high school or if they're in college or they're second year law school, if they act that age and if they act as if they're out with their friends or they act as if they're, um, you know, throwing paper at each other in practice, that's, that's going to reflect as they're the less professional group and their evaluations are going to suffer. And you couldn't, you could not advance and you could not have success in mock trial if you don't just assume the role of a professional from the very beginning uh, as it relates to witness examinations very important heightened attention focus on um, your witness ask questions no ands or ums or or so or repeating the questions back try to breathe when the answer comes back take a pause and then start your next question who what, where when why describe explain type questions on direct if it's cross examination slow down ask leading questions try to get to yes if you get something other than yes listen for those answers and try to use them maybe it's some rope that uh, that you can use with the witness in the next questions but be patient be in control if there's an if there's an objection we've talked about it several times in the concept in the in the context of professionalism if there's an objection and you're the proponent you're the one putting on the evidence you're the one engaged in the witness examination you don't turn and snap your head and face the person objecting that you have that discussion through the court so you turn the few degrees from the witness examination to the court wherever that is and you talk through the court no matter what it is it looks very professional you give your left ear hole or your right ear hole to the party objecting and you face the court talk through the court no matter what happens from the court you move on seamlessly to your next question if you get stuck in trial you know we get stuck we forget where we were we lose our place your honor may i have a moment to confer with co-counsel go have your meeting with co-counsel you walk back to your spot your, your honor may i resume that that conveys professionalism you know how to take a break you know how to uh, find your place uh, and because your teammates 
are connected and invested in your presentation, they should know where you are. And you, they, they've heard it before. They, they might even have a copy of it in front of them. When you walk over for that meeting, you're right here, you're doing great. Okay, right back to it. So you, you should be able to help as a teammate that's sitting at a council table. But I'm going to look, I'm gonna make an overall assessment. If I were had a, you know, a, a contest where it had different categories, one category in mock trial is always professionalism. There's just no other way to do it. So if we were just looking and took everything aside, maybe I didn't even hear the words that you were saying, maybe I don't know anything about the case, which side look like lawyers, behave like lawyers, and have conducted themselves in this mock trial like lawyers. They're gonna get some edge, be that team no matter what, and then work on the substance from there. The next one, this might be the most important. Uh, there's gonna be a lot of things that happen at trial. And I told you, you're, you're inexperienced, you're new to mock trial teams. They're, they're, it's gonna be like a script, it's gonna be like a play. They're just gonna try to write out direct examination questions for their witnesses, uh, plan out the answers that are gonna come from those witnesses. Uh, an opening statement's gonna sound like a speech at the beginning where they've worked on it as a speech, it doesn't deviate. And then closing, which it just can't be, is just going to be a bookend speech at the end of the at the end of the trial. Um, that's 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 no reaction. That's you trying to conduct a mock trial like a play. Uh, and we have drama in school. We have we have people that are in theater. Uh, go there for that. If you want to memorize lines and present and be able to have a range in your character, go there. But if you want to be uh, in mock trial, if you want to compete in mock trial, if you want to have success in mock trial and you have a seasoned evaluator like me who's, a, who's looking at this trial, I need to know the things that happen at this trial, particularly the things you don't anticipate, things that happen on cross-examination. Maybe an exhibit didn't get in because you just successfully objected to something that the other side was trying to put in. Maybe they promised something in their opening that didn't happen during trial. Whatever happened during this trial that's unique I want to know that it's going, you've made it part of this presentation. Um, you know, they told you an opening statement that you were going to get to see an exhibit. Uh, and whether you noticed or not, that exhibit is not before you now. And the reason it's not before you is because they can't deliver on that promise. It's not admissible evidence and their witnesses couldn't sponsor that exhibit. So if they can't deliver on an exhibit, maybe they can't deliver on their other promises like um, meeting their burden of proof as it relates to the elements of the offense. You know, th there's arguments to be made that show that you're paying attention to this trial and you're reacting to what happened in this trial. It should be incorporated. If there are precise words that were used, of course you're gonna know some of the precise words that were used on direct examination because you've worked with your, hopefully with your colleague or somebody that the competition provided as your witness and you're gonna get those words out. Incorporate them as if they're in quotes in there being cut and pasted and pulled forward to your closing. Uh, incorporate. The, that thematic language that comes from your opening and try to incorporate that in um, in your direct examinations and even in your cross. When something happens in cross and you elicit, uh, you know, of course you're gonna elicit some credibility challenges for witnesses that say things that are not helpful to your case, but sometimes you just elicit on cross examination in a leading fashion as you're permitted to do. You just bring forward some facts that are favorable to your side. And there's a way in closing to incorporate that. Even when I had the opportunity to ask questions in cross examination to the detective in this case, that's their witness, that's a witness that they called. He said that he was not at the scene uh, when the alleged assault took place. So that's their witness that here today in trial said he was not present at the assault. That, that shows me that you're, you asked the question for a purpose, you were listening for the answer, and you made it part of your presentation. That wasn't just a cross-examination in a vacuum never to be heard from again. If you had a point in asking the question, it should have some place and some home in your closing argument and your team's closing argument. So I'm looking for the team that is really reacting to what happened today at trial, and especially the unique parts of today at trial, the precise words today at trial. What quotes are they dragging forward to be part of their closing statement? And how are you incorporating the dynamic parts. If your closing sounds like a speech that you could have given before this thing started, it, you know, it's never going to be as good as an advocate and a team that stands up in closing and really pulls from what happened. And, and a great example of that, although it's probably um, the most obvious one is, you know, there's oftentimes the party with the burden will go first in closing. They'll have their closing uh, argument. Then the other party, the opposing party, will have their closing argument. And there's oftentimes a, an opportunity to have rebuttal. Sometimes it's an overall clock. You have 10 minutes left, leave one minute for rebuttal, something like that. And the rules will specify how you can use rebuttal. But in that rebuttal, 
you should be commenting on and talking about the other side's uh, argument. You should be talking about their closing. They want to tell you in closing that we haven't met our burden, but we've explained each one. They want to talk in closing about how you shouldn't believe this witness, but look at all the other evidence that corroborates what that witness said. You're reacting to, and it's incorporating what happened at trial, including the other side's uh, closing argument. And lastly, uh, you know, it, it does seem like it all comes down to closing sometimes, but really uh, the whole team must know whether it's your theory, whether it's your theme, everyone must know where we want to be in the end. If this thing all goes swimmingly, if it all goes according to plan, where do we want to be with our closing in the end? How does it all come together? And it's great if parts of a witness answer are pulled forward to that closing. Parts of cross-examination questions and the witnesses from the other side are pulled forward. Exhibits that we worked hard to ask the magic words and ask the questions to get in, they're displayed or otherwise referred to in closing statement. How does it pull all together? So again, if it's too scripted, if it's too head down, if it's too disassociated from a presentation to uh, to a real jury while well, I'm sitting there as an evaluator, I'm going to question it. I'm going to, I'm going to wonder, you know, uh, am I watching a drama class? Am I watching a play about a trial or were you able to make choices, have a clear theory, have a clear theme as to how you're going to explain your case to me with thematic language that's going to pull through the parts of trial? Do the questions you ask in direct actually contribute to what we're saying and what we're arguing here in closing? Do the careful questions that you craft for their witnesses on cross-examination, do they score points and make points that you can refer to later on? They're going to place great weight on statements the defendant made here at trial but we've talked to you about and you had an opportunity to hear our cross-examination about all the reasons why um, the plaintiff shouldn't be believed in this instance it's maybe there's credibility challenges maybe they've had inconsistent statements um, so you make that argument and you are doing it for a purpose at trial and then you return to it a real effect effective closing argument in a case is a, is a reflection and a mirror of trial and all the connections that you've tried to make with that jury throughout trial. So if you ask the right questions in cross-examination that had a kind of thought bubble going off in the juror's head, the evaluator's head that says, wow, there's some real problems with that timeline as it relates to this part of the um, this part of the crime or this part of the claim. The timeline's really a challenge and doesn't add up. By the time you or your colleague, your teammate stands up in closing and say, you know now there's a problem with this timeline. Uh, it's not so buttoned up as the other side would have you believe. There's a gap from this time to this time. You're making that argument closing, but you've already made the connection earlier in trial. You're almost reminding them of the hard work that you did and the questions that they as jurors or evaluators came up with during the trial. So these are the parts of trial that I look at and that I can't help but evaluate and really separate out what's a what's a great uh, trial advocacy, a mock trial presentation, and what's one where uh, you're doing your best, but it, it's 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 going to be outshined. It really has to do with these items. How are you pulling it all together? How are you making connections with the jury? How do you convey your theory and your theme? What are you doing here to incorporate uh, the presentation and make it part of the end? Um, I want to look at all those things to see how it all works together. And I think if I was blindfolded and taken to somewhere and then even it was in a different language and it was translated for me, I'd be able to look at it and say, this team's more professional. This team incorporates more of what went on. This team's taking care of me as, as audience. This team brings it all together. I look at that team and again, individually at some of the advocates on certain teams to say, they're the ones that get it. They're the ones that are doing everything that we're talking about in these collection of videos in this introduction to mock trial.